Look at Senator James Lankford of Oklahoma. He's a member of the Intelligence and Homeland Security Committee. Senator, thanks for joining us. Glad to be with you all. Have you been briefed on the strength of the intelligence that was collected in that raid in Yemen? Yeah, you and I have spoken on these issues before. I don't ever talk about uh, what we've actually been briefed on and what we're walking through right now. Uh, but obviously, uh, when you go on the ground uh, to be able to actually go into a location, you're obviously uh, very aware that there may be valuable information there. There's a reason you do an on-the-ground uh, attack rather than actually do some sort of attack from the air and just drop munitions uh, and be able to take things out. Your uh, Republican colleague, Lindsey Graham, today warned President Trump against overselling the gains in that Yemen raid. Do you agree with uh, the senator? Well, I, 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 would, I would say we don't know fully what is gathered there. Obviously, it takes a long time to be able to get all the full information of what comes out of a raid like that. Uh, when you gather information, there's translation. They work through the process. So they have different tiers of what they're trying to get immediately uh, based on immediate attacks. And then they begin to work their way through the process. And it takes a very long time. And as you go, uh, you hit troves of information and veins of good information uh, that take you different directions. Have you seen uh, the uh, information that leads you to believe that a, a now a revised travel ban, including banning at least six, maybe seven Muslim-majority countries, is necessary for U.S. national security? Those are decisions the president makes actually dealing with it. I would tell you, that as, as we have spoken before, uh, and I don't know exactly what the travel ban is going to list. Uh, obviously, we're all waiting on that uh, and what that's going to include. Uh, but when you're talking about Yemen, when you're talking about Somalia, when you're talking about Syria, uh, when you're talking about a terrorist nation like Iran, uh, those are high-risk countries regardless, especially in a situation where there's a failed government like Yemen, Yemen and Somalia and Libya. What about Iraq? Would you include Iraq in that list? I would not for me personally uh, because we have a longstanding relationship with Iraq and with the new Iraqi government. We're, it's more reliable of the documents that we're receiving there uh, because of our intensive relationship. But when you're dealing with Yemen, Al Qaeda has been very active in trying to move attacks from Yemen into the Western countries, including trying to target the United States. That's long been aspirational for them and that's very well known. And that is a completely failed state with no functioning government currently. But we're told that Iraq was originally included in the first executive uh, order because so much of Iraq, including the second largest city, Mosul, at least a huge chunk of Mosul, is still under the control of ISIS and people fleeing Mosul, for example, they may wind up in Syria, they may want to wind up in Turkey, but they, there really can't be much uh, serious vetting of these individuals. Well, that depends on how, you, how much you trust the documents. If you can have reliable documents coming back forth and we have a trace on those individuals, that's true. But we're not talking about opening up all individuals being able to move. This is not like they're moving uh, from Canada back and forth in the United States. There's a lot of vetting that already occurs right now. Uh, so every individual that petitions to be able to come to the United States from Iraq is not accepted currently. Uh, this is a total block on those individuals to do an additional examination or whether you're going to try to keep up the high standards that we already have now. If they're coming from Mosul, if they don't have reliable documents, if they can't show a, a nexus to be able to come to the United States and a reason for that, they're blocked right now. Uh, what President Trump is proposing is a stop for a moment to be able to do a serious evaluation of is our vetting system high enough for countries like Yemen, Somalia, uh, Syria, Libya, other countries where we do not have functioning relationships. Let me move on to another key issue. A senior administration official uh, tells me that uh, President Trump now believes, as President Obama believed at the end of his administration, that North Korea represents the greatest immediate threat to U.S. national security. Do you agree? There are a lot of immediate threats. That's the difficulty for any of us trying to narrow this down, whether it be cybersecurity, whether it be narco-terrorism, uh, whether it be ISIS. But when you deal with uh, North Korea specifically, they have been very clear on their development and their testing of nuclear weapons. They've been very clear about their ballistic missile program, and they've been very clear that they're trying to create a weapon that will reach the continental United States. And I don't know of another leader uh, with nuclear weapons that is as unstable as the North Korean leadership is. So it is a great unknown uh, when you try to predict what someone's going to do or what is a deterrent to a North, Kore North Korean leader as unstable as he is. We don't know of what a re really good deterrent would be on that. So that does make him a very strong, um, very serious threat to the United States at any moment. He certainly does. Uh, uh, thanks very much. I, I want you to stick around, Senator Langford. We have more to discuss. We've got to take a quick break. We'll be right back.
President Trump on the comprehensive immigration reform, but did he really mean it? We're back with Republican Senator James Langford of Oklahoma. Senator, uh, President Trump uh, told a group of journalists yesterday in the White House, including me, this, and I'll read the on-the-record quote from the president. The time is right for an immigration bill as long as there is compromise on both sides. Uh, but our White House reporter, Sarah Murray, is now reporting that a senior administration official, a source uh, calls that simply, uh, in the words of this official, a misdirection play designed to give the media a storyline to generate some positive news coverage for the president. But uh, it, it wasn't really serious. Uh, what is your reaction when you hear that? When we deal with immigration reform, there's a lot of things the executive branch can do. Obviously, there's a lot of law in place that has to be enforced. But ultimately, if you're going to do real immigration reform, that is, has to be a cooperation between the House, the Senate, and the White House. It's been the barrier that we've had for several years. Then we try to do the simplest things, like even dealing with people that have uh, graduate degrees, uh, graduating from the United States, keeping them a green card, and so they can stay here. When we try to do those reforms, in the past, they've been blocked, saying, no, we need to do larger reforms as well. There are a lot of things that need to be done in immigration reform that can be done. There's a lot of common ground issues already in immigration reform. The challenge is going to be is trying to focus in on what can be done and not try to create this into something that can't be done politically or shouldn't be done politically. Uh, so I think we should actually work towards legislation on this, and that's probably going to be this fall at the earliest. We've got dealing with the Affordable Care Act. Uh, we're dealing with tax, uh, tax policy. We've got a regulatory reform. Then we'll probably be able to get to immigration at the earliest this fall. Would you support comprehensive immigration reform if it included a pathway to legal status, not necessarily citizenship, but to legal status for millions of undocumented immigrants, uh, allowing them to work, pay taxes, raise fa families without fear of being deported? Yeah, I would have to see the exact text and how that works and for who that's extended to and how that's extended. I, 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 there, I would never support something that leads to citizenship. Uh, quite frankly, in my own personal perspective, in my own faith, in my own journey, there's, there's something very, very special about American citizenship. And I don't think you begin that uh, with an illegal act at the beginning of developing that relationship. And that is the ultimate cutting in line uh, that we have people like in the Philippines that wait 30 years to be able to come through the legal process to be able to get here. So that, that is definitely off the table for me, how we would deal any other relationships, who would be able to earn that kind of legal recognition status, I'd have to be able to see the exact proposals on that. Uh, but we absolutely have to be able to do something in a lot of areas of our legal system. Even the 50,000 people a year that get citizenship based on the visa lottery system is nonsensical just by this open lottery system, rather than as the, what the president talked about last night, a merit-based system, very similar to what the UK does, or what Canada does, or what Australia does, where their target is, do we need those jobs? How does that work? What's the best entrance? Are you coming to be able to do research and development? Those things are other countries do. We have not in the past. That's a wise thing for any nation to be able to focus in on immigration. What about the so-called dreamers, the children uh, who were born here as little kids raised in the United States uh, by their parents? Uh, uh, would you allow a pathway to citizenship for these so-called dreamers? Yeah, that, again, there's a lot of complications on how we would do that. I have to look at it as a package. I would not exclude them uh, as individuals. Some would say, no way, I would never do that. I would not exclude them in that conversation because there are some of those individuals that clearly should be able to work through our system and to be able to uh, come on as Americans because they've grown up and been here their whole lives. We as Americans hold people to account for actions they have done, not actions that their parents have done. And so that has always been a, a challenge for us in dealing with the law in whatever that may be. But just because you're a dreamer doesn't mean you actually come through the process. I was talking to some law enforcement folks in Tulsa, Oklahoma, just last weekend that was in the process of deporting a dreamer because they were one of those individuals that was involved in a gang, in narcotics trafficking. They're now 19 years old, been here since they were 11 months old, but they're now being deported because they violated law. So you can't have any kind of blanket rule on that. You and the president, based on what I know, uh, Senator, you both seem to be pretty much on the same page on all these very sensitive issues, but uh, we'll see what happens down the road. Uh, Senator James Langford, thanks very much for joining us. Thanks, Will. Just ahead, uh, does his well-received speech mark a pivot in President Trump's uh, presidency? Plus, we have details of payments by the FBI to the former British spy behind the dossier.